Well, welcome back to another episode of the Addy Hour. You can probably tell from the background we're doing something a little bit different again this time as well. So I'm actually grateful to the Yale Broadcast Studio. We're actually recording in the podcast studio today, so a little bit of a different setting. Um, but again, grateful to be here with all of you. Today, I have the immense pleasure of welcoming a friend, colleague, and mentor, Dr. Charles DK. And today, we're going to be talking about faith, spirituality, and psychiatry. So three topics that we don't often hear in the same sentence, but something I think is very and good, very good for us to continue to think about and to discuss. Um, and as I've already alluded to, Dr. DK has been a mentor to me in a lot of ways, specifically around these topics, but in other ways as well. And so for me, it's really full circle to be able to welcome him to the podcast. In some ways, the reason I'm actually sitting here having this conversation with all of you is because of the mentorship that he's given me over the years. So again, grateful that he's taken the time to invest in me and that he's taken the time to be here with us in this conversation. Uh, thank so you Dr. very DK. much. Thank no. you very much, Dr. ID. I think you're being too kind. No. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Not at all. Those, those early conversations early in my career definitely had an impact. All right. So I'm also excited that you all get to get to know Dr. DK a little bit as well and to hear some of his insights on this podcast. So I did want to start just by giving a little bit of an introduction to him. He has lots of different roles and lots of different titles, so I'm only going to give a few of them here. Uh, but Dr. DK is currently the chief medical officer in the Office of the Commissioner for the Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. He's also an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and co-director of the Law and Psychiatry Division. He's co-editor of Behavioral Sciences and Law, the Behavioral Sciences and Law Journal, and he also chairs the Ethics Committee for the American Psychiatric Association. He also has a lot of uh, awards and accolades. He's been named as a distinguished fellow for lots of different organizations. The one that caught my eye in particular was the fact that he is a diplomat in clinical psychiatry to the Royal College of Physicians and uh, Surgeons of Ireland. That one I did not I did not expect to see. Maybe I'll have him expand on how that came about as well. But again, just honored and grateful to be able to welcome Charles DK to the Addy Hour podcast. Thank you. And so as you all know, and as Dr. DK knows as well, I usually just like to start out checking in with our guests to see how they're doing at this point in time. So Dr. DK, if we could just start by asking how you're doing these days with your day-to-day -day activities and with everything that you navigate um, and try to juggle, as it were, uh, family life and professional life as well. Yes. Well, thank you so much for inviting me and thank you for the introduction. I am doing well. <laughs> I'm very grateful. Very grateful that every day I am healthy and well. My family is healthy and well, despite the ravages of COVID and the two years of intense uh, protests across the country and across mm -hmm. the world. I'm just grateful that we are still here and we're doing well and we're healthy. Excellent. Yeah, I think that's so well said and, and so important and grateful that we can be even in this space and in this conversation, again, as you mentioned, with everything that's gone on um, over, over the last few years. And of course, with things that happened before that, which have also come to light in a lot of ways. Um, and I know we'll jump into this even more so in the conversation, but I know that will be part of the topic that we'll talk about as you've invested in some of these topics in so many different ways as well. Uh, but as listeners heard, you do have a lot of different leadership roles, which I mentioned. So I also wonder if you could just let our listeners know what your day-to-day -day or day-to-days look like um, on a regular basis, how you occupy and, and, and spend your time during the day. Yeah, I have been privileged, even blessed, mm to hold all of these positions uh, of authority, of leadership. Mm -hmm. And my day-to-day my -day is often consumed by working for the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, uh, being at the table where decisions are made regarding mm -hmm. the provision of services to our patients, the fighting for resources, for our uh, patients, uh, psychiatric, severely mentally ill individuals uh, have often been marginalized in our society. So we have mm -hmm. to fight for everything uh, to enhance their care, to enhance their well-being, and to protect them uh, in, in our society. So my day-to-day -day job is often uh, fighting those battles at, mm -hmm. the, at the areas where I am able to make policy decisions and and uh, and and ideas and things that relate to that. 
I also have been privileged to participate in the education and training of the next generation of physicians and psychiatrists and forensic psychiatrists. So my I, I have the dual um, opportunity to both participate in the provision of care, but also train individuals who will do the same in the future. That's a real blessing, I think. Mm. Very well said. And again, many of us are grateful for the work that you are doing in these roles and for the impact that you have in the community. Just to pick up on one thing that you mentioned and that you said at the beginning is that you have the opportunity, the privilege, and the blessing to be at the table and to be involved in these decision-making processes. Um, I was curious if you could take our listeners on a little bit of a journey about how you got to the table in the first place. How did you arrive in this place? Because that's something that isn't always granted uh, to many of us, especially those of us from black and brown communities. So I'm curious if you could share about that aspect of the journey as well. Yes. I, um, I, I went to medical school in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I had my residency training in psychiatry in England which is where I obtained all those degrees, including the, the one from Ireland. <laughs> and then from after that, I came to the U.S., mm -hmm. uh, additional training in Chicago. And finally, I had my fellowship training in forensic psychiatry at Yale. After the training, I started working at the Maximum Security Psychiatric Hospital in Connecticut. And I, I did that job for about four years. Mm. Um, and one of the blessings I would say is that my time at that position led to dramatic improvement mm. in the, uh, lot of individuals who were really, really ill, uh, very difficult to manage, refractory, and as a result of serious mental illness had committed crimes, mm. which is why they ended up in the maximum security psychiatric hospital. But the uh, being able to change the tone of the work on that unit uh, to just making life easier and better for the patients led to dramatic improvement on that unit. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when the position of the medical director of that hospital came up, I applied along with other people across the country, but I was chosen to do the same across the hospital to improve the services of patients across the hospital. That's how I became medical director of that hospital. Then I continued the same processes. It led to another significant improvement uh, across the hospital. Now, it's, of course, you know that uh, this type of work is not just one person. It's you and a lot of other people. But just being able to motivate others and work with them to get to the point where the whole hospital was had also improved remarkably. Uh, and so on. Then I became the head of that hospital. Then after a while, the idea uh, came from the commissioner's office that maybe um, I should participate in doing the same across the state. Then there was another interview. Um, and by this time, my work had become recognized publicly. Mm -hmm. I had been uh, interviewed by the Boston Globe and NPR and people had shone light on the changes that had happened mm -hmm. at the hospital. And I was being consulted to do the same across the country. But then, so when the commissioner's office, um, I, when I was lucky enough to be hired to be the deputy medical director in the commissioner's office, um, that was the start of uh, the enhancement, I would say expansion of my role across the system. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful to hear that, that story and that trajectory. And also to know that people were paying attention to the impact that you were having. But then, as you appropriately mentioned, it wasn't just you. There were teams of people that you were working with to make this impact as well. And so I think that's really important to be able to highlight. I'm also curious, as much as you're willing to share, I mean, you've talked about the successes along the way and not to detour too far from our topic. But I think it's also important for people just to know about the successes and the challenges that came along the way as well. So as you are making your way up and having this impact, was there any pushback um, that you noticed at any point along the way? Were those were there any who were trying to detract you from what you were trying to do? Or was it something that just was a smooth process uh, moving forward? <laughs> I could write a book about the challenges <laughs> and I the anticipate. barriers <laughs> and the obstacles. They were huge. Um, you know, I think change is hard. 
to be to start with. Change is extremely hard. To change the culture of a an institution that has been existing for a while that has uh, what I would call practices, not policies, but negative practices. Mm-hmm. To change that culture is pretty hard. To change the culture as a young man coming from Yale who's black, I think is even additionally very hard. I had lots and lots of headwinds mm-hmm. <laughs> and challenges and detractors. Um, but I think ultimately I, I was able to prevail. But I again, I want to highlight the fact that uh, my being able to prevail had to do with my, that's for my faith. I mean, I was determined mm. and I had to see myself as working for a higher power, mm-hmm. not working for a regular human being, because um, you have to have something beyond you to be able to overcome the challenges that come in front of you. And I, I had to hold on tight to the fact that at the end of the day, I could go home and say, have I pleased my God today? Mm. Uh, despite all what people have done today, have I done that? Mm. And so being able to have a your own faith, <laughs> your own, uh, a, I would say, connections, that tightness that allows you to move forward, regardless of challenges, mm. uh, are things that I have personally benefited immensely from and continue to guide me today. Mm-hmm. That's wonderful to hear, and the, the fortitude the, and the undergirding that it, it sounds like your faith was giving you in that journey along the way as well. I know we're going to tie back to that throughout this conversation. Uh, but one thing I also want to ask, would you say, are there ways in which your faith and what you have been doing in your vocation, would you say that represented a calling? And if so, how? How has that been a calling? How have you carried that out? I think that the, the biggest area that I always highlight in my own head is that to whom much is given, mm. much is expected. Um, I also have, I, I would call it a spiritual, religious faith injunction to take care of the less fortunate. Mm. The, the biggest driving force for me that kept me going, regardless of all obstacles, was because I focused my attention on the less fortunate Mm. and trying to improve the lot of the less fortunate. Therefore, no matter how difficult things looked like to me, no matter how challenging they looked like to me, they were nothing compared to what some of our patients were dealing with. So the, the, the injunction to pay attention to the less fortunate became a really driving in, you know, faith injunction for me, as well as the idea that I always appreciated that much has been given to me. And I'll have to use this much to make an, a, a, a difference mm-hmm. and be able to stand at the end of the day, every day stand and say, have I made a difference today? Mm. Well, wow, that's, I mean, that's very encouraging to hear. And also in a sense, humbling as well, because I think many people could look at you with all of the accolades that you've gotten and put you up on a pedestal, whereas it seems like you're trying to do the reverse and really think about those who you are serving and what they are walking through and just being humble in that approach. So I think that's very, very refreshing to hear in a lot of ways. And I think speaks to um, the benefit that we have as a society of having people and individuals like you who are truly invested in the work and seeking to make an impact in people's lives. So I, you know, on behalf of the listeners, just want to thank you for that approach and that investment as well. And, and obviously the not only for those who you're serving in those specific roles, but as you've mentioned, as you're training others as well and serving in many different ways. Thank you. So you also touched on the fact that change is hard, and that's something that has been an important conversation in the last few years. But even with the topic that we're talking about today, thinking about faith and uh, spiritual practice, spirituality and psychiatry, how has that tied in with, how, how have all those three tied in together? Because I would imagine that there are aspects of resistance there, there are aspects of openness. So what has been your experience as a person of faith trying to be invested in people's lives as a psychiatrist? Where do you see some of the tension points and where do you see some of the opportunities? Really great, but complicated (laughs) question. (laughs) You know, when you look back in history, far, far, far before the um, development of medications and uh, development of mental and even medical specialties that we have today. Spirituality was paramount, was at the center of everything. People would 
you know, illnesses were explained by, by one's spiritual beliefs or spirituality. Um, the healing was from spiritual beliefs and, and spirituality, religion, faith, such that people would say that something was wrong with your spirit. Now we need to fix your spirit somehow to get you better. This you could really go back to before medicine. And then with science and with technology and with all these new things happening, uh, spirituality, faith began to take a background, began to really be moved aside. And as far as psychiatry is concerned, I think one of the biggest challenges that then happened was when one of our, I would say the father of psychotherapy, one of the main figures in, psych in psychotherapy, Sigmund Freud, mm -hmm. uh, stated that the belief in God was actually a reason why people got sick sometimes, that anxiety, neurosis might all be due to the fact that people believed in God. And therefore, the way to heal human beings was to use psychotherapy to disconnect them from the belief mm. in, in God, and that might help them get better. Uh, and you, so a lot of people, because he had a huge voice, a loud voice, a big voice, that became a very, very serious problem in psychiatry. I have to say, though, that his voice was not the only one there. There were mm. counter voices, but they were not quite as loud as Sigmund Freud. I mean, Carl Jung's belief was the reverse. He said that mental illness was because people were deviating from God, mm. deviating from the practice of God. So the struggle, I'm just saying the struggle between where does you know faith, spirituality, and so on fall in psychiatric care has been existing for a long time. But what then happened was that the biological, psychological, and social aspects of care uh, took um, center stage and religion and spirituality were pushed aside. And that has been the case for a while. And you know, to compound uh, on this, I think that the, there was a disconnect. There's always been this disconnect where the vast majority of adults in America uh, believe in God and they mm -hmm. believe in uh, spiritual religious practices. The vast majority use their religious beliefs to cope with stress and distress and other things that happen with mental disorders. So the vast majority of people do that in the U.S. Even those who do not believe in the God of the Bible, so to say, believe in a supernatural being or a supernatural power or force which they also connect with uh, to help them resolve difficulties. So on the one hand, you have a public that is steeped in religion and religious beliefs and spirituality and faith. Mm -hmm. And then you have the treatment community that do not have that. They have the reverse. Psychiatrists have the least connection to spirituality. They have mm -hmm. the least connection to God, the least belief that there is uh, that God exists or that there their problems can be resolved through a focus on their spirituality. Uh, psychologists, many of them are atheists or agnostics. So the vast majority of treaters, mental health professionals, do not have those kind of connection to spirituality. Whereas the vast majority of the potential patients believe in that. And that, that has been the struggle so far, I would mm. say. Mm. There's a, there's a lot there, and I think it's helpful that you've taken us through the history as well. I wonder, and some you know, some listeners may already be deeply familiar with this as well, but for those who aren't, so what type of, because as you're talking, to me that only sounds like tensions that are just waiting to happen. What types of tensions has that created over the years in terms of the general population and the practitioners? I mean, has there been room for dialogue? And I know that some things are shifting, but I'm just curious historically how that actually has played out in terms of trying to bring care to people? I'm very happy that things are changing and I can talk about the change in a little bit, but mm -hmm. how it has played out is that um, individuals of faith who have mental health problems have had difficulty presenting their full selves mm. to their psychiatrist or their therapist or their psychologist, social worker. Because presenting their full self would mean presenting elements of their religious beliefs 
and spirituality. And it's not because they haven't even done that. They had done some of it in the past. But the response they had received from uh, clinicians have not been helpful. Mm -hmm. Uh, They have been dismissed, um, even disparaged, or made to feel less than. And, And so they hadn't been able to really fully explore their full selves in treatment. And aspects of treatment that, you know, wholeness of care, which looks at the body, the spirit, the mind, the community, all of those things are involved in patient-centered care. You have to look at all of them. But when a patient feels that they can't come with all of themselves to you, that will lead to discouragement Mm -hmm. in even seeking psychiatric care. And these are the individuals who have overcome the stigma, the already huge stigma associated with mental illness. So once you fight the battle, you fight the stigma, you overcome it, and then you see a psychiatrist, and then the psychiatrist belittles your beliefs or disparages it or makes you feel like, you know, you are the problem. (laughs) I I think that really has been problematic. Mm -hmm. But the good news, the good news is that that's shifting now. Mm -hmm. in that the vast majority of psychiatrists are now open to this. They're willing to listen. They're willing to try trying to understand where you're coming from and trying to work with the patients to support them in this journey. Uh, one of the things that has also helped this movement is the fact that there's uh, the recovery movement. Recovery uh, is now a huge term in psychiatry, the recovery movement, recovery centered care. That really centers on a journey. It's an individual's journey in life. Mm. It doesn't focus so much on the symptoms and the signs and disabilities, but in fact, more what gives you meaning, what Mm. gives you hope, what helps you recover, what helps you overcome stressors, and what's the journey of life for you like. So that, that's, that movement has, has helped enhance uh, the the need to focus on the full person, including their spirituality and their religion. That's definitely good to hear. And it seems like there's a, a mutual or a, a goal, at least, of trying to have a mutual understanding and more of a holistic approach to allowing people to bring their full selves to that situation so they can walk on that journey um, in a more uh, effective and holistic manner, which is definitely encouraging to hear. I'm curious in terms of the shift that you talked about, what are some of the other aspects that you think have been helpful in that shift? Because it sounds like there has been misunderstanding. I mean, we've talked about from the psychiatrist or psychiatrist or psychologist, but likely both ways as well, also from those from faith communities coming into these spaces, likely partially due to the disparaging that they felt Mm -hmm. beforehand. But what are ways that some of those misunderstandings have been clarified, would you say? I think... Um, so I'll take the misunderstandings from both sides, from mm-hmm. the clinicians and then from the patient's point of view. I think the clinicians, many of them are worried that they, they are not really trained mm-hmm. uh, to engage in these discussions. And um, they feel ill-equipped to be able to participate in discussions that have to do with spirituality and religion. If you um, add to the to that the idea that in this country, religion, faith, spirituality is considered something that is personal, it's a private matter. We shouldn't be mm. talking about it in public. Uh, what if we have differences of practices? If I have a, a from a different faith and you're a different faith, how are we going to engage together in uh, therapy? How can we talk about these things? Um, Some of people, clinicians, are also worried that the way they respond might be upsetting to patients. Mm. If they don't respond appropriately or they make comments that might not work properly. Um, And then there are those who are worried also that a focus on spirituality and religion could detract from the work of psychotherapy. For them, that's something different. I think people are beginning to understand that the work of psychotherapy can be enhanced by these areas mm. as opposed to being detracted by it. But this is what some people have worried about. Others who have focused more on science have wondered whether this was, since this was not based in science, you know, faith, spirituality, religion is not based in science. Uh, and I'm a scientist. 
Therefore, I really shouldn't be wasting my time in those areas. That has been one other misunderstanding. And finally, I think some have wondered if it's even ethical to mm-hmm. practice, you know, to bring spirituality and religion in, in this treatment space that is almost a sacred psychotherapy or psychiatric treatment space. Mm. So those have been the misunderstandings from the um, mental health clinician's point of view. The misunderstandings from patients have also been very difficult. Mm. Um, Some of them have thought that um, even considering uh, mental health symptoms or focusing on a mental health symptom or having mental health problems is evidence of their moral failings. Mm. That this is fact, this is uh, what shows that they have failed morally, that they have sinned. Uh, this might be a punishment from, from, from God or somebody else for their sinfulness. And they view the idea of seeking psychiatric treatment as evidence that they are failing to trust God. Because really all you need to do is confess, you know, do other things you need to do, then pray fast and have others pray for you. And you will be fine. And, but not doing that and seeking psychiatric help is uh, not trusting God. It's evidence that they don't trust God. Others um, even avoid beneficial treatments if they perceive that these beneficial treatments would conflict with their religious beliefs, which is a really important thing to consider. Because if you think that this is against your religion, um, or might conflict with it, you might have difficulties even engaging or listening or participating in it. Um, others sometimes use their religious beliefs to uh, justify whatever is going on with them. You know, in a, if there's abuse in a marital relationship, well, you know, you really can't break up. You know, it's part of, you know, there's, the, the spirituality or their faith beliefs might make them stay where they are supposed to be. And they're probably not willing to listen to a therapist who might be trying to figure out other mm-hmm. ways for them to engage uh, with society. So you see the misunderstandings mm-hmm. on both sides, on the mm-hmm. patient sides and on the clinician side. That's where the difficulties have been. Yeah, and so many pieces of what you've you've pulled out, I think, are helpful for people just to hear and reflect on as well. Another thought that came to mind, I mean, one of the things that we've talked about a lot on this podcast has been the idea of cultural competence and just knowing people's cultural backgrounds, especially for mental health professionals, making sure that they understand where people are coming from, what their lived experiences and not trying to take one way of life and superimpose it upon another individual. As you're talking, it makes me think that this aspect of faith and spirituality also falls within that umbrella of cultural competence, having an understanding of people's faith background and what they are, how they are bringing themselves to the table and able to be able to navigate and walk through that with them as well. I mean, has that been something that you've seen in your experience, either in your practice or talking with others as well? It has been, um, in fact, the American Psychiatric Association has recognized this mm. in our Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, the so-called DSM. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The cultural formulations and cultural formulation interview has become really prominent. Mm. Um, Psychiatrists are encouraged to ask questions about people's religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, And as part of that cultural uh, formulation is religion, spirituality, family, moral identity. Mm -hmm. For some people, you can't talk about their culture without including religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. Moral identity, spirituality is part of their culture. You can't say then that you are culturally competent Mm -hmm. when you ignore this huge element of their culture. Therefore, um, asking questions in these areas about how these cultural elements, such as the religion, spirituality, have been helpful or stressful or supportive Mm -hmm. to the test to the individual in front of you is crucial. Mm-hmm. Because the fact of the matter is that sometimes they could be quite stressful to people, mm-hmm. <laughs> even as they could be supportive to people. Yeah. And you need to understand them so that you can be able to provide more appropriate care to people. So, yes, yeah. cultural uh, competence, cultural respect, more or less these days, is, is, is crucial in, mm-hmm. in this uh, discussion. And that's great that it's been incorporated and that it's been incorporated with all aspects too. So not assuming that it's been beneficial beneficial or 
harmful, but giving individuals the opportunity to have that space to have those conversations, because as you mentioned, it can go um, both ways. Another piece which you mentioned is just, you know, this idea of incompatibility between faith and psychiatry or psychology and science. Um, and as we've been having the conversations on this podcast, as we've hosted different town hall events, it's been very interesting to see how people are starting to talk more about the ways that those things are compatible. I mean, I've had conversations with people who said they grew up always being told or having to understand they were, they were incompatible or starting to see some of that compatibility more so um, over the years, even in terms of you know some of the spiritual practices and some of the psychological interventions. I mean, so much so that people are thinking about, well, how are those spiritual practices actually impacting people's brains and how they approach certain situations and how they navigate through things? I've had you know pastors who've asked uh, clinical psychologists whether their practice of reading through um, scriptures is an aspect of cognitive behavioral therapy. And, you know, just thinking about all the intersection that comes with those pieces as well. So I wonder if there's any aspects of congruency or consistency that you've also noticed just in your, in your experiences as well. I think that um, one of the really cool things that I, I believe uh, are happening now is the incorporation of spirituality into even regular care. Mm. All right, so I'm going to get to that in a minute. But if you look at the treatment formulation for mental disorders in the past, and which has really held sway for many years, there have been biological treatment, mm -hmm. which is you know medications, um, investigations, different types of investigations and so on. So biological treatment, psychological treatment, which is the psychotherapy, the opportunity for individuals to um, present their struggles and have a, a trained person help them navigate the struggles and the difficulties and help them overcome them, you know, which can be through all kinds of methods, whether it's through, you know, changing or how you think, mm -hmm. uh, understanding how, how you think affects how you behave and how you feel and helping you work through that or any other forms of therapy. Then I think a really important element to treatment that people brought in was the social treatment, mm. which is, you know, homelessness, housing, food insecurity, mm -hmm. uh, violence. If you, if you live in, if you have any of these things as part of your life, it's very hard for you to fully recover. Mm. If you're going to go back to an abusive home. You're going to go back to an environment of violence. You're going to, you're not going to have enough money to support yourself, no transportation to access services, uh, and no food. If you don't have any of those elements and you're, you know, unemployed, it's very hard for you to be successfully treated with mm -hmm. medicine and psychotherapy. So I think the addition of the social element has been a real boost. But what has been missing all this time is the addition of the spiritual mm -hmm. element. Because for a lot of people, that's just how they cope. Mm -hmm. They cope with their spirituality. Their hope is in their spirituality, is in their whole wholeness, is in their religion, is in their faith. And therefore, no matter how much of all of these other elements you bring together, if you don't enhance the ability to participate in these areas, it's going to fall short. And so I have been really fascinated mm. and impressed with the newer treatment modalities mm -hmm. that have included um, spiritually focused or uh, modified treatments that have augmented spirituality into regular care. I have been really fascinated by that wow. and, and by the findings that are coming out from those types of studies. Now, now I'm curious. What are some of those findings that that have that have come out as people have have been delving into this area? Some of which I'm familiar with, but I think it'll be great uh, to have you share on that, and for our listeners as well. I think that the first thing to even talk about is why is or how is it that people believe mm -hmm. that religion and spirituality are beneficial, even just alone by itself, without mm -hmm. the addition of those things into treatment, just alone. Mm -hmm. um, lots of research have come up in recent years that show that you know, for people who participate in religious activities um, have a, just a better 
health generally, physical mm-hmm. and mental health generally. People who um, are more religious uh, 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 and they participate regularly in their religious activities are physically healthier. They have healthier lifestyles. They require fewer health services. That's just broadly speaking. Mm. But then um, women, research that have looked at women who attended weekly religious services found that they had lower mortality Mm. compared to those who did not. And the more frequent they attended the religious services, the lower the mortality rate, which is really interesting. Uh, Attendance at religious services, people found, were associated with decrease in depression and a six-fold reduction in suicide risk. Mm. Wow! So just the subjecting of these ideas into research is showing these benefits that high intrinsic religiosity often leads to more rapid remission of mm. depression to those individuals who have depression. And people also who have this high intrinsic religiosity, um, they adapt more successfully to stress and more mm. quickly than those who do not have it. Mm. So that's just generally looking yep. at it, that there's a general overall general benefit to physical health and mental health when you participate more in religion, spiritual, and you have faith. Mm. But the, the, the types of treatment that we're talking about now that I, I'm excited about is the fact that people have compared, for example, existing treatment modalities like cognitive behavioral therapy on the one hand, and then cognitive behavioral therapy plus mm. religious uh, augmented with spirituality and compare the two of them. Mm. They found that religious CBT models for depression or spiritually focused therapy generally, Mm -hmm. religious psychotherapy for depression and anxiety or spiritually augmented cognitive behavioral therapy have all been more effective than the psychotherapy alone by itself, Mm. than the cognitive behavioral therapy alone by itself. Spiritually augmented cognitive behavioral therapy has been very beneficial in decreasing hopelessness and despair, Mm. improving collaboration of care with patients, decreasing relapse rates, enhancing functioning and recovery for patients. Now, they have been found to improve depression. They've been found to improve anxiety, psychological problems, psychosomatic problems. But what is actually really interesting is that um, two things are interesting about this therapy. The therapist who is non-religious, a non-religious therapist, have actually been found to have more effective at providing this care <laughs> <Wow>. than religious <laughs> therapists. I was really blown away by that. Wow. Um, that, so, yeah, there's the, the most recent one that came out, was it last year or this year? I'm not sure now, where um, uh, group psychotherapy. Mm. So in group psychotherapy was carried out in uh, hospitals, in residential homes, and intensive treatment programs. And that group psychotherapy, they added spirituality mm. to it. So it's spiritual psychotherapy in all these areas. They also found that the therapist who was not religious had a higher effectiveness at this <laughs> than others. The other thing they found was that uh, everyone improved whether they had religious affiliation or not, they all improved. They had significant benefits regardless of setting, whether the setting was in a hospital, in a residential home, or in outpatient intensive treatment, and also regardless of the patient's connection or lack thereof mm. to, spirit, to spiritual beliefs. So this is really exciting, wow. I think. Yeah. yeah, that's really amazing to hear. I mean, a few things are coming to mind even as you were talking earlier on about how that used to be more dismissive, it seems like in some ways that could have left a missed opportunity in a lot of ways yeah. for some of this really effective um, outcomes and moving things forward, um, especially you know even those without a faith background who seem to be more effective uh, for whatever reason um, in, these, in these situations as well. But I think it speaks to just the, the power of bringing people's whole selves and the power of these spiritual practices as well. You know, as a scientist, I can imagine that some may say, oh, well, is that a real effect or is that just a placebo or is it the community? But I think that at the end of the day, the fact that it is having 
and effective outcome speaks volumes and just speaks to the importance of making sure that you don't dismiss that important part um, of people's lives. Um, and even as you're talking, it's reminding me of some of the um, some of the neuroscience studies that have been done around this as well, specifically aspects of prayer or meditation and how people respond to pain. So people who have spiritual practices who are meditating or praying to a higher being, their brains have a lesser response to painful situations and they actually have a lesser or a higher threshold for pain in some of those situations as well. So again, tying in both aspects of general health, but just also how that is actually impacting our brains as well. And I know I'm, I'm leaning back towards my neuroscience because it's my natural <laughs> inclination, but it's really, it's really encouraging to just hear all this research is coming out and also to hear that it's being incorporated that much more so as well. Um, on that note, I also wanted to ask a little bit about practitioners as, as well, because again, this is just in my general impression, but I seem to be interacting with more and more practitioners over the years who also have a faith background. And I would imagine that those people and those individuals like yourselves are also able to potentially bring that to the table or bring that to the discussion as well. But I'd be curious how much you're willing to share about that as well, because I can also imagine, as you talked about, some may feel like, oh, is that unethical for me to bring this aspect of myself into this clinical situation? So how do practitioners who have faith backgrounds, how do you all navigate that aspect of things? I think that the question of whether or not there's been an increase in practitioners of faith is a, is a good one. Uh, is, is really whether there has been an increase or whether people are feeling much more comfortable mm. expressing it now than they would have in the past. Um, people were worried that people might see them as all mm. kinds of things if you present yourself as a particular faith um, in this field, in this space of psychiatry. So it might be that people are feeling more emboldened in mm -hmm. talking about it. Um, but it also might be that there's an increase based on how things have moved. I mean, I think <clears throat> our society, people are more willing to express uh, things related to their faith or their beliefs on this. So maybe there has been an increase as well. <clears throat> One of the things that we always have to focus on when we are thinking about is this ethical or is this not ethical? And people have worried about that. So mm -hmm. is um, an understanding that if you always put the needs of your patients first, ahead of anything, ahead mm -hmm. of your own needs, ahead of your own feelings, ahead, if you put the needs of your patients first, it's very unlikely for that mm -hmm. to be unethical. That's good. That's a really important way to think about it. To spend a second and say, Am I doing this because there's something it is doing for me? <laughs> is it just benefiting my own self, my own person, ego, spirit, mm. whatever it is? Or is this really benefiting this patient? And if, if you can conclude that you are benefiting your patient, then you should be less worried about whether it is um, uh, ethical or not mm. ethical. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is, that there are some religious practices that could be harmful to mm -hmm. patients. And in those situations, you should be able to, to not participate in that. You should be able to let the patients know that these religious practices are harmful to you. And that's not the way to go. Even though you respect their mm -hmm. views, you respect their religion, you, again, this is why it's so important to strike a good therapeutic alliance mm -hmm. Because if a patient believes that you have their best interest at heart, and a patient believes that you're willing and open to understanding where they're coming from, to see them as a whole person mm -hmm. and with everything they come with, if they believe that and they have that connection with you, it actually allows you to be able to point out when things are problematic mm -hmm. without them feeling attacked um, because they know that you're coming from a good place. And so um, we can't ignore bad things happening to patients just because we want to respect their religion. That mm -hmm. would be unethical. Mm -hmm. We can't um, not provide patients with what they need. If a patient needs medications, you can't not encourage them to take medications because you're, you know, mm -hmm. you, you're in line with their belief that all they need is prayer. That would be unethical, mm -hmm. you know. 
if a patient needs other forms of psychotherapy to assist them in recovery, you really need to encourage them to do that as well, as well as encouraging their spiritual, their healthy, non-harmful spiritual beliefs. Mm -hmm. Well said. Yeah, really well said. And I, and I love the fact that it's so centered on the, on the, uh, the patient, the individual as well, making sure that you're doing all that you can to support them and to, to help bring that, that healing. Even as you mentioned about at the beginning, that your motivating factor um, in all of this as well. So I think that's really important. One thing I should also mention for the listeners, one of the topics we'll actually cover in an upcoming episode is having individual psychiatrists who have actually been involved in specific faith communities to actually have services that are offered in those faith communities as well. So both Dr. Ayanna Jordan and Dr. Sydney Hankerson will be joined to talk about some of those some of those components, individuals that Dr. DK likely knows as well. Um, but again, just really highlighting all these different components. And again, kind of in the same vein of what you talked about, making sure that these practices are actually put together. And it's really encouraging to hear how it's been so impactful for a lot of people as well. Um, as we can, you know, as we get close to wrapping up, I did also just want to ask a question to talk a little bit about what gives you hope in the work that you do. Um, and again, even just emphasizing that you speak and you work and move in so many different spaces. I mean, we talked about your work with patients. We also talked about your uh, work at the state level. You've also testified before Congress as well. So first of all, I guess to ask how you navigate all of these different spaces so effectively. And as you do that, and as you engage in the work, what gives you hope going forward? Uh, I think the question is, do I navigate them effectively? <laughs> <laughs> I would say so. <laughs> uh, you know, so yes, I am. Um, I think it's, again, it's been having the opportunity to participate in discussions at all these levels have been extremely rewarding. Mm. Um, at the American Psychiatric Association Ethics Committee, um, we grappled with this idea of the ethics of practicing psychiatry and incorporating religion and spirituality. And I can mm. tell you that it was extremely mm. heartening to participate in that mm. type of discussion. Um, you know, so it's, it's not so different from what I meant by being present at the table where you, you're part of policies, you're mm. part of decision making and discussions and Part of my role in some of these areas is to also educate my colleagues who mm -hmm. might have, you know, no affiliations, no religious affiliations, no understanding to help them understand as well why this might be important. So the dual role of um, policy generation, discussion, service provision and care and education, that dual role has been really, really crucial in all everything I find myself doing. Every opportunity to be, um, uh, to, to teach and to educate people, mm. it's a welcome opportunity. Every opportunity to participate in saying, you know, how can we increase this here or, or there, or the resources or services have been really beneficial. What gives me hope in uh, navigating these areas is, um, I can say every single time I have presented this type of topic, mm -hmm. I have been impressed with the number of questions that I have received from people. I've been impressed with the attent attentiveness of people. I've been impressed with the desire, I think the desire and hunger that people have to participate in this space. And the people are coming at it from the point of view of, how can I make it work? Mm. Which is different from, oh, this is useless. This is not science. Mm. You know, get it out of here. That's a whole different conversation. If the conversation is, you know, I'm just worried I might say something wrong. Or mm. I'm just worried it might come out. I might do unethical things. How can I make it work? Mm -hmm. I am encouraged by that kind of discussion. Mm -hmm. I'm very hopeful that people are paying attention to this. I'm hopeful that even uh, um, guiding documents in psychiatry are putting a spotlight on this area as well. The one area that I think I have really been disheartened so far, but the fight continues, the battle is still on, is training. Mm. I think that 
um, training of practitioners of all disciplines, social workers, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, therapists of all disciplines has been lacking so far in the incorporation of spirituality mm. and religion and faith into treatment. Mm. So that is one area that I think we have a long way to go. Yeah. It has to be something that we are emphasizing just as much as we have emphasized biopsychosocial mm -hmm. care. It is really important to add biopsychosocial, spiritual slash religious care to make it four rather than three mm -hmm. <laughs> in, the, in the treatment. So that's the one area yeah. that we still need uh, some work. We have some work to do, but otherwise, I'm really hope I've been hopeful with how people have engaged with the topic so far. Yeah, that's wonderful to hear and encouraging in a lot of ways to see that movement. Uh, but to your point, also, it's it's also interesting to think about the room, the places where there's still room for growth as well. It actually makes me think about some of the conversations that we've had earlier in this podcast with those in pastoral or clergy roles as well. And it seems like both of those need to move simultaneously. So one um, pastor, in, in particular, Pastor Michael Walren who has spearheaded and helped to develop a hope center in Harlem that's affiliated with his, with his congregation, also talked about from the clergy standpoint how there needs to be much more in terms of thinking about aspects of counseling and mental health care for those who are going through. I think he said for him there was only one course that he had. So it seems like on both sides, this is a great opportunity for both sides to be able to integrate that and even potentially work in partnership. But again, at the same time, it's it's helpful to hear that that conversation has started and there are ways that people are asking questions and wanting to implement. But again, something that I think is important for us uh, to move forward um, as a society. So for any who are listening who may be leaders in this space, I hope that that's something that you'll um, take to heart as well, because I think as we've heard Dr. DK mention, there can be such a tremendous uh, impact that having those conversations and that integration uh, can really have. Um, and the course, one with... Yep, go ahead. Go ahead. Nope. Go ahead. The one way to, uh, to approach those type of partnerships, mm -hmm. which I believe are absolutely crucial, partnership with the faith community, mm -hmm. partnership with other advocates, is being respectful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have to go in respecting the faith traditions yeah. <laughs> of the group. We have to go in um, helping them understand that we are coming to enhance mm -hmm. what they are already doing because they are already doing a lot. We're coming to yes. enhance what they're already doing. We respect what they're doing. We are not discouraging them. We're not dismantling what they're doing, mm. but we're coming as enhancers and we're respectful of mm -hmm. them. That's very important to have that, or hopefully mutual respect Yes, yes. Uh, when we engage with these partners. Yeah, I 100% <laughs> agree. Thanks so much for making that point as well. And again, it just speaks to, even as you talked about the therapeutic alliance, it seems like that needs to happen for practitioners and faith leaders as well to have, again, that level of trust and respect. So very well said. And of course, thank you for the ways that you've done that as well in so many different arenas and avenues and for your leadership uh, in, in really leading the charge in a lot of ways. Again, grateful for your willingness to be here on this podcast. I can't say enough grateful for the ways that you've invested in me. Uh, for any who are watching this as a video podcast, you may get tired of my consistent head nodding throughout the episode, but so many things <laughs> that Dr. DK mentioned definitely resonate. I think we're so important. So I think, again, this is a really informative conversation that I think will help a lot of people, even as they think through some of these components. So Dr. DK, thank you again for being here on the Addy Hour and for sharing all these wonderful insights with us and for sharing aspects of your journey as well. We definitely appreciate it. And I want to thank you for being in this space, mm. for creating this space. I think the importance cannot be overemphasized. Mm -hmm. It's just um, allowing individuals to come and present their full selves and to be uh, respected, acknowledged mm. by someone who is so accomplished as yourself. Mm. Um, I think this is wonderful. I, I'm just proud of what you're doing. And I'm proud wow. of who, you're, who you've become and who you are still wow. growing to become. I'm very proud of it. So uh, keep, keep the flag flying and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. That means a lot, especially coming from you. And I'll definitely continue to, uh, to move forward with the undergirding, the mentorship and investment that you and so many others have given me. But that's, I'm, I'm very grateful, very grateful to hear that. Thank you.